Thanks so much, Nick. That's such a kind um, introduction and characteristically modest um, about the role you've played in these conversations. And it's just such a pleasure to be here talking with you, Nick, and with part of the Templeton community, because while well, you've um, uh, introduced really well the kind of role that relationship has played in developing this this field of study um, and as part of that research and, and beyond it there have been so many conversations with um, I guess the sort of wider Templeton community at various events connecting with different projects and so on so as well as supporting our work um, all those points of connection have just been such a stimulating um, and helpful and important part of the work we do as well as the very considerable um, significance of uh, of the work of the points of connection we've had between my, Nick and my own work over the over the years. Um, so it's really a great pleasure to be here and um, I will get on with things because I look forward to the discussion we have at the other end with everyone who's here today um, so much and I'm going to try and share my screen so you can see see that. Um, I'm getting a nod. I like, yep, great. Okay, great. So yes, I'm going to speak to this uh, title, the world's fourth largest religion, quote, unquote, um, understanding unbelief around the world. And that phrase, understanding unbelief, um, is the title of the most recent project um, that we've been working on with Templeton. So that ran between 2017 and um, uh, 2021. So the very end of 2021. So it's still hot off the press stuff and lots of things still coming out of it um, as well let's face it and um, I've used this phrase talking about the largest religion because I think that I think that's come across in what Nick said already but this question of scale is so important to what this project was all about and what I'm going to talk about today but underlying this so we've got this large program of work in which we've tried to be global in our outlook so engaging with researchers from around the world and doing research in many parts of the world um, and that's justified because we can think about unbelievers and I'll talk a little bit more about what that might mean um, as a very sizable global population whether they're the fourth largest religion well, we'll come to that, but they're a very, very sizable global population. So we need to, to work on a scale that reflects that. And what, what happened, as Nick said, was sort of about 15 years ago, there was very little work, uh, research in the human sciences engaging with this population. There was a little bit, but it was more or less kind of ad hoc and quite disjointed and, you know, there wasn't much of it. Um, and this, this interest has grown and grown and grown. And at the beginning of this project, we got to a point where there was some really important um, interventions we really improved our understanding of what's going on with atheists agnostics and and other so-called religious um, unbelievers but it was still work that was very much focused in especially coming out of the UK the US some important work coming out of Germany and so on but still very western in terms of where the work was being done and even in those areas there were very particular individuals and demographics that were getting lots of attention but we are talking about a very sizable number of people that can be um, the source of this claim is from a sociologist called Phil Zuckerman, who used this phrase, the fourth largest religion to talk about um, the non-affiliated. Um, and it gives a sense of the scale of what we're talking about. So those studies in a handful of countries were just not going to cut it. And we needed that cross-cultural understanding um, as well as we needed to work across disciplines to really kind of build a much better understanding of what's going on. I think an imperfect but possibly helpful analogy is with something like um, political apathy or um, inactivity. So if you were interested in a political landscape and you, all the research had focused on people we'd decided were politically active, so say we're talking about voter behaviour and we're interested in people who vote. Um, for all for years and years and years we just weren't interested in those who didn't vote at all or we were describing as politically inactive for some reason you can see that there would be a lot to learn a lot to learn in that route but a lot that was being left out once we turn and engage with those people who aren't voting or aren't politically active not only do we learn about a potentially very large population that have that shaped that political landscape in really important ways but we also then learn something about the politically active. We maybe come back, we maybe learn that this political inactivity is actually not inactivity. People are engaging in ways that we weren't anticipating and that changes what we think political activity is. So if we're looking at unbelief, um, 
the analogy runs that we're going to learn a lot about belief as well. It's just of profound importance and it needs to be work of it necessarily needs to be work on a on a scale that working with um, Templeton on these big projects has enabled. So it's, it's been really exciting and and important work. And I'm going to share a little bit about what we've learned um, on that journey. Uh, so those are the big questions which I think I've um, pointed out what we're connecting with here are really profound questions about what we mean by being unbelie uh, being an unbe unbelieving. Do unbelievers have alternative religious-like beliefs? What forms do those take? So again, that's where straight away you realise that the study of unbelief is also the study of belief. There are things we can only understand about religious-like beliefs if we understand this so-called other. How are these beliefs similar or different to religious ones? And can unbeliefs and other beliefs that they're bound up with play those same personal and social roles of religious beliefs and underlying all of that is coming back to this question of, of what is believing. So the project looked at atheism, agnosticism and other forms of non-belief in God or gods which are widespread and growing so that's the context of this research as well as those fundamental questions about what it means to be a religious unbeliever and indeed what it means to be religious. So let's get our um, brains thinking about atheism if you're not already. Um, so if you would indulge me in either closing your eyes, it can be physical or just imagine, and just take a bit of space to think what or who comes to mind when you think of the term atheism. Might be an individual, might be a figure, might be a type of person, might be a set of associations of some other kind. And I'm not, they're, they're, this isn't a test, and um, I won't ask you to share what's come to mind. Just a bit of space. What comes to mind when you think about atheism? We could do the same with agnosticism, which is a key part of the programme of our research, as I've mentioned already. I'm not going to go too far down that route, partly because one thing that our research has confirmed is that what people mean by agnosticism is very diverse and lots of people don't know what it means, even those who use the term quite a lot. People who use it as an identity, when we interview them and say, what's it mean? They say, oh, 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 I'm not sure. So I'm not gonna go too far down, down that line for now. We did actually ask this question as part of the research we were doing. So um, part of our research was a central research project in which we worked in six countries around the world and we did surveys in those countries and we uh, did in-depth interviews um, in all of those countries. And we also did a free listing or a free association exercise at the beginning of those in-person interviews where we asked people, what do you associate with atheism? What do you associate with agnosticism? Also, we asked them about what they associated with God and religion. Um, and that was a very interesting exercise in itself, but it was also helpful for understanding the, the rest of the, the data we were getting back. So when someone says they believe such and such in a survey, they believe such and such about God, what do they mean by God in that sentence? Let's, let's, let's get that piece of context so we can understand. So it's something we've done and actually um, has been so helpful that it's now been picked up and it's part of um, a kind of suite of teaching materials that have been um, um, being developed for um, schools in England and Wales, I think it is, rather than the UK, I think that's correct. Um, when which students kind of engage and think about what does atheism mean by thinking about what they associate associated with and then learning something about the, the different associations that you find in these different countries. Um, just to give you a sense, these are the places that our research touched in this research program. So the blue um, are places where research took place, just to give you a sense of that scale. And the data that I'm going to talk about today focuses on our core research project, which was focused um, um, uh, on, the U on the UK, the US, Denmark, Brazil, Japan, and China. So I'll mainly talk about those areas. What we're doing there is trying to work in depth with places around the world, but find places that have very different religious landscapes and non-religious landscapes. So that although we couldn't do in-depth interviews in every country around the world, we, can, we could have those conversations in places that were quite, quite different and are gonna tell us something different about that kind of global, um, atheism and agnosticism and forms of religious unbelieving as a global phenomenon. And what we had in mind were um, people who agreed with statements, the, the two following statements, which are quite common in surveys. So in practice, this is how we found people to work with. People either agreed with the statement, there's a kind of classic survey question that has six answers. 
um, about where you stand on God. And one of those answers is, I don't believe in God, um, which we call the atheist group. And one of those answers is, I don't know whether there is a God and I don't believe there's any way to find out. So that's the, what we call the agnostic answer for our purposes. Um, note that it's not fence-sitting agnosticism. The first part of the sentence could be, I don't know whether there is a God, you know, maybe you live your life as though God may exist. And there's that kind of Pascal's wager approach. But actually, this statement is asking you to make a stronger, um, a stronger stance and saying, I don't believe there's any way to, to find out. So it's a, a strong epistemological statement, at, at least. Um, it's not quite a sort of fence sitting position. And I did just want to highlight um, that this fourth largest religion, I've got to make the admission that that is from this, um, this uh, formulation by Phil Zuckerman, a sociologist, and he is talking about people who don't affiliate with a religion. And as Nick said, that's not the same as not believing. Um, and that's true in our data. So just to introduce our people, there's a lot happening here, I know. So, um, but these uh, colors uh, will repeat themselves across the slide so you can get to know them. There are um, data here from our six countries and you can see the colors at the bottom there. And what this slide is telling you is what the people in our survey, what the atheists, the so people who said they don't believe in God prefer to identify as. And you can see that non-religious, the second um, on the top bar, the second across, was quite popular. So it's, it's something people identify as, although it's by no means the only um, identification that people prefer. You might be interested to note that atheists, a minority in all of our countries, identify as an atheist. You can see that in the very first column. It's still the most popular overall, but it's small numbers. And it's the US. That's, the US is always in navy blue. US at the bottom there, um, for which atheism as an identity is the most important, still a minority, but that identity is much more important um, in the US than, than elsewhere. So this kind of, you can see straight away that just doing your research in the US and the UK might lead to real kind of misunderstandings of, um, of the landscapes. This is the same for agnostics, um, but let's put the data the other way around. We asked our atheists and agnostics what um, they answered a, a very the standard identity or affiliation question you get asked do you consider yourself as belonging to a particular religion most of them say no religion but by no means all and the same is true the other way around so if you people who identify as non-religious uh, large numbers in many places are also people who don't believe in god but they're definitely not the same thing so why have i taken us <coughs> down this route i'm going to defend it by saying well, in the first place, the sense of scale is not inappropriate. It gives you the number, the global numbers we have are um, still re relatively hazy for atheism, atheism and ag agnosticism, but they're in a similar order um, uh, to non-religion. They're smaller, I think, overall, but we can still think about whether we want to chart this population alongside other religious belief systems. So moving away from identity, thinking about belief systems. And the reason I'm doing it today is I think that's it's quite interesting to do the sort of formulation that Phil's um, developed here, the fourth largest religion, opens up those questions about what non-religion is. Is this appropriate to chart unbelieving belief systems alongside religious ones? Are they are they similar enough for that to make sense or not? Um, and those are the kind of questions I want to talk a little bit um, more about today. So I don't know what came to your minds when you thought about atheism. Um, but there are two kind of common visions of uh, atheism and agnosticism that we come across, certainly in the literature. One is not very much. So I'm thinking here about the shadowy figures. This was a painting I used as the cover of one of my books. So, it, so I quite like it in relation to this topic. Um, but those shadowy figures. So we're, we're just we're interested in these people insofar as they lack something. Um, they're not religious. What does this absence mean for them? which is a very important thing to think about, but it's not about um, what these people believe in, do, and so on. It's sort of about what they're missing and the impact that might have on them. That's one way of thinking about unbelievers. And another, um, as Nick has uh, sort of alluded to already, is um, our friend Richard Dawkins, but a whole set of other figures, um, Nietzsche, Marx, Darwin, who himself um, 
his relationship with religion is much debated and there's lots of complexity to it, but there's no denying that Charles Darwin is a real figurehead in parts of the atheist movement um, and is someone you come across if you research in this area for any length of time. These sorts of figures, and we might group them together as kind of rationalist humanists in their orientation, and they're associated with these sorts of things. A lack of, no belief in God, sure, but also associated with rationality or rationalism, science, um, being anti-dogma. Uh, others associate them with a very dogmatic viewpoint. Naturalism, humanism, these sorts of orientations, moral relativism. And in the case of all the examples I've just given, often white male, European, quite well educated. So I don't know, that some, someone who might have fitted in this area might have come to mind of some of you, and that's certainly the case um, uh, in if I'm talking with students or journalists, in fact, in the UK, going to one of these figures to illustrate your article about atheism is the absolute go to thing. Although we're always in touch with journalists who are desperate for, <laughs> for different ways of representing this population. Um, but this is where they turn first very often. So let's look at the belief, some of the beliefs of unbelievers that we come across and think about how well they fit that, that model. So some things um, won't surprise you, maybe stack up with that kind of image. So the scientific worldview, we do find in our data that, so looking at the left-hand side, what you're seeing is um, the, the, uh, country, the bolder colours are atheist and agnostics combined and the um, lighter colours are the general population. Uh, for comparison. So we asked in our surveys uh, whether our participants agreed with the statement, the scientific method is the only reliable path to knowledge. And what you'll see is more or less across the board, the atheists and agnostics endorse that view. So the scientific method is the only reliable path to knowledge. And we find the general population, which is necessarily less atheistic and agnostic, so more um, religiously believing, uh, endorses that view less often. Although you, you might notice that Japan is something very different goes on in Japan and we are so interested in Japan it's a really interesting case I'm happy to talk more about that um, in the Q&A if people would like to know more and for anyone looking watching online um, do look at our website and the further discussions we've got around that because it is a really interesting case. Second item is about evolution humans have developed over time from simpler non-human life forms again that follows the expected kind of route so the non-religious are more likely to endorse that view. Um, Japanese agnosticism. I've decided not to go on a huge, uh, on a foray in that direction, but as I said, very, very happy to talk about Japan. Um, but other things go on that don't fit the picture. So one thing is that most atheists and agnostics around the world are not nat naturalists in a sense we've created, um, which is uh, they don't reject all of the supernatural beliefs that we ask them um, whether they endorsed. So what you're seeing here are atheists on the uh, left-hand side of the circle and agnostics on the right-hand side. Um, so a striking feature is that agnostics are much more likely to have some kind of supernatural belief. But the atheists, so people who say don't believe in God, it's still a minority who, who reject all supernatural beliefs that we ask them about. So it's around a third um, in all cases or a quarter a third. Is, um, we set a relatively high bar, so they had to, in a way, this isn't surprising, we're not totally surprised that atheists have some supernatural beliefs, but that high bar is the one that you see associated with Dawkins and so on, that image of the atheist um, as being very kind of rejecting all of those sorts of beliefs, and we don't find that. Um, again, look, Japan in yellow, very similar in terms of supernatural belief to all those other countries. So that, that disinclination to science is something quite different in Japan to what you might imagine. Japan, Japan, Japan. Um, other beliefs we might associate with that kind of rationalist enlightenment, European humanism of Richard Dawkins um, and others. Here we've just pulled out a couple of examples. One is about progressive, that kind of sense of progress that we associate with the enlightenment so we ask people in the long run do they agree with this in the long run society becomes better over time and in general the um, atheist and agnostics were more pessimistic about society so much less convinced about progress than the general population i mean the difference isn't great it's worth noting that um 
The same is true for moral, a moral relativism item. So what is right and wrong is up for each person to decide. Again, the general population, which includes the religious believer portion, was more likely to endorse that moral relativistic view than the atheist and agnostic. The exception there is the US. So the US does conform to the standard model. The difference isn't great, and I think that is important, um, but it does conform to that standard model. So again, we get that sense of if we do our research in one setting and try and understand what an atheist is from that one setting, we may be slightly misled. So looking at the beliefs of unbelievers more substantively, what do people believe in? So rather than us pre-selecting things that might matter, we also asked, tried to get some, learn something about the existential um, uh, sources of meaning that people have in their lives. So these are the values that atheists and agnostics um, and the general population chose from a very long list of values. Um, and so in each case, the bolder color is our atheists and agnostics, and that slightly lighter color is the general population. And what I want to highlight here is the values are very similar the top values are very similar in all countries. Uh, and also what we find is that the um, greatest line of difference is between country, mu much more than between believer and unbeliever within that country. So family and freedom are very important values absolutely everywhere. But then you see different things. So um, in the US, for example, we can see truth appearing and it's exactly as important to believers and unbelievers, same as true in the UK, that's the green bar. And then we see that the truth doesn't appear as a value in any other country apart from um, uh, lower down the list in Brazil, the general population. So there are those sorts of things uh, which lead us to, to affirm that unbelievers have beliefs, but also to question that sense of whether the difference between believing and unbelieving is the most important way to understand uh, the differences in these in the outlooks of this popular of these populations. Um, <clears throat> there are interesting things we could do here. This is pulling out an example of atheist and agnostics in Japan and the UK. So we can look at these um, values in more detail, which is something we're doing to kind of build more detailed pictures of the worldviews of unbelievers. Um, some interesting things come out of that. In the UK, friendships are a very important value, which appears nowhere else. So we're quite interested in that. But you can see the conversation that might be happening between unbeliever beliefs and local religious beliefs. So truth is a very is a value that's has um, it's very associated with Christianity, particularly Protestant traditions, and we see that appearing in the beliefs of unbelievers in countries with those religious traditions, whereas something like the present moment. Um, fits, um, speaks to some of the religious traditions in Japan. So we have this emerging sense of the beliefs of unbelievers as something that compile into cultural packages that are like religions in some way. They have meaning in people's lives. And a really nice kind of illustration of that is comes from a project which I really love um, that our, our program funded. Um, so we had these 21 projects that were funded um, and that's how our project we were able to reach into all those different countries. And this is from a project by Anna Strahan and Rachel Shilato, who worked with children um, in, in schools in the UK. And there are children in middle childhood, so I think it's between seven and 11. Um, and an extraordinarily important project because we have very little research with children. And obviously, that's a really formative stage in, in the development of our belief. So it, it's, it's a really, really significant uh, project and also a delightful one, <laughs> which I think you get a sense of here. So what, what these images are are drawings that um, Rachel asked the children she was working with to draw in response to um, she said, what do you believe in? Can you draw me a picture of that? So this is a drawing of these children's beliefs. Um, and it gives a sense of what they think belief is, the type, type of things that come up, dragons. So these sort of um, quasi-supernatural, the status is sort of ambiguous status for children. They sort of know they're real and, un and unreal at the same time. Big fluffy unicorns, <laughs> rainbows in the bottom corner, um, Batman and so on. But we also get these sorts of drawings. So these are drawings of the Big Bang by these young children, um, which is you know, really interesting to see that in response to a question about belief, so this isn't a question about science, it's not a question about the world, it's a question, this general phrase, what do you believe? A sense that this is a really important 
kind of construct, part of their believing narrative. And this idea, um, identity that some atheists have of having a scientific worldview um, with a sort of capital S and a capital W, you can see that being formed in, in these drawings. So this sense that what I believe in is science. And it's a really particular way of understanding science. And it's a really particular way of, um, of being an atheist. So those are just some of the kind of cultural assemblages that we can see the beliefs of unbelievers compiling into that are analogous to a religion in some way in that they're a sense of, um, they're a set of commitments and beliefs that are part of um, children's cultural and social lives in, in a similar way to religious beliefs. So I'm, yeah, um, keeping an eye on time because I want to talk with you all. Um, so let's come back to this question, the world's fourth largest religion. How, how daft is that um, of, as an idea, a, a way of thinking about atheists and agnostics? So some conclusions we can draw from this. So non-religious systems of meaning, I think what we're seeing are, we've only been able to get to the tip of the iceberg today, but they are, complex and they also don't conform to stereotypes of being scientific, rationalist, purposeless um, or amoral. That's certainly true but also they're not these sort of we can't learn everything we want to learn about these populations by thinking about what they're not. We need to know what they are. We've got this huge um, body of data about what people believe in and how those impact people's lives um, uh, now so we have to move away from that. These are not good figures, figureheads to have. They're not inappropriate. These are people who were atheists, so they're not, not irrelevant. But if they come to mind at the expense of this global diversity, then we need to kind of rebalance that. Um, and something, um, oh yeah, this is an important point to make. The majority um, have values that aren't substantially different from or diametrically opposed to those held by uh, mainly uh, by um, religious believers. So that suggests that that kind of binary, religious and non-religious binary distinctions are really unhelpful if that's the go-to binary that we're doing. If that's the way we're going to understand our religious landscape, it's going to be very limited. And what is successful about this idea of unbelievers as the fourth or whatever it might be, fourth or fifth, uh, largest world religion is it moves away from that it says this is a population that are part of the same landscape they're not a kind of other or an opposite to this landscape and I think these kinds of images are really helpful this is one of my favorite um, outputs of the project we um, also um, worked with um, various uh, photographers, documentary makers and so on um, are around public engagement with our research and these are some photographs by Aubrey Wade of some unbelievers from around the world in the countries that we worked in and it's such a powerful um, it's such a powerful way of expressing that diversity and that sense of these being full rounded people about which we might have a lot to learn in relation to their their agnosticism and um atheism and that just that sense of diversity i think it communicates communicates that so powerfully so i think we should move to those sorts of images when we're having that thought experiment i'm fairly interested to know what came to people's minds when they thought about what atheism was if anyone had any image um which i think i i, I do images like dawkins come to my mind you, you know straight off the bat that must be wrong to the extent quote unquote because there's so many atheists and agnostics around the world there must be more going on um, and it's important to kind of think about though who comes to mind when we're, we're understanding these populations it tells us quite a lot about the societies we live in are these people all members of a community so we've got this much more diverse understanding of these people as atheists and agnostics is it coherent enough that we can think about them as part of a religion? Is that just maybe going a step too far? Well, the beliefs of unbelievers do come together into these cultural packages, so maybe it's not so inappropriate. Maybe we want to think about worldviews or different kinds of languages. It might not be so helpful to talk about them as religions because that may be that where there are important differences that we're then at risk of losing sight of. As we've seen, there are some differences between atheist and agnostic belief systems and believer belief systems, as it were. Um, there also isn't one, but several. So I don't know if I want to place, say, it is the fourth largest religion 
because we think there is a bit more going on. Um, so there are some transnational themes and cultures, but we, we can't reduce them to one or even two types of belief system. So there's a few more within there. It may be that it's several religions, if we want to keep that metaphor or worldviews. How many? Uh, well, that's something else we're working on in the project. So that's going to be, um, I don't know if we can call it a cliffhanger exactly, but something to keep you coming back to our project <laughs> website and learning more about, about what, we're, what we're doing. Um, and that's where you can find some more information. And I'll end there. <laughs>